Hey, this is His Word Unveiled. Thanks so much for joining me today. I cannot wait for what God has for us today. Our last video, we started a new book of the Bible, the Book of Lamentations. This is a book where most people avoid, want nothing to do with, because it's just known as this depressing book. Like it just lays out these wailings and this grief and this mourning and suffering and affliction and all of this and lamentations. Um, it excites me though, because what most people see it as and why they turn away, oh my goodness, if they only knew that there's so much more in this book. So that's what we're doing, that's what we're about. We're about discovering what that newness is, what that depth is, what that so much more is. So God's gonna move. He, he is on the move. He has got plans and purposes for us today as we walk through another chapter in this incredible book. So Lamentations, chapter three is what we are covering today. So cannot wait. Chapter three sets itself apart in a lot of ways from this really poetic book of the Bible. So we're going to hit that today. Um, I'm so excited. So hit that pause button and be so purposeful. Just run after the Lord. And as you read, listen to him speak. As you read, just sit, just be still so that he can move you, so that he can unveil things to you. Don't skip over, don't rush through, don't get bogged down in the depression of it. Choose to see deeper. Let God take you deeper to show you so much more. We can be changed. Our lives can be absolutely changed by a book like Lamentations. So let's not put God in a tiny little box. Let's say, Father, have your way. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come and just do the impossible. So let's do that. Let's go after him. You're gonna read and as you read, I'm praying and we are gonna walk through Lamentations chapter three together. Lord, we love you and we truly do just invite you here and just say take over. Father, we know that you hold all power. Nothing is impossible for you. And if you have planned and purposed for us to be changed by this chapter in Lamentations, then so be it. Father, we are, um, we make ourselves willing and available for you to do whatever. God, shape us and show us and teach us today. I pray that your spirit and your spirit alone, that you are the only spirit here and upon us and with us. Father, I just speak against the spirit of division and the spirit of deceit and the spirit of frustration and discouragement. In the name of Jesus, I speak against all that the enemy wants to do in pulling us away from what you have for us today. Lord, we love you and we trust you and we look to you today for growth, for wisdom, for revelation. <sighs> May you be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Lamentations, chapter three. Excited. So um, if you read um, Lamentations chapter one and two and went through that video, we talked about how this book is so poetically written, that it's this ordered and structured kind of way of grief and showing purpose and so much pain by the way we do it and examining and thinking and being purposeful about taking action then. Um, so good. So we went over the first two chapters having 22 verses each in each chapter and, and with the lines and, and how it's written. It's so, so poetic and there's so much purpose in it. And we talked about how 22 verses um, was to, to symbolize, was to be, there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. So verse one started with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph. Uh, verse 2, the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and all the way down to the very last letter, that 22nd letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Tav, being in the 22nd verse. So beautiful, just beautiful how God would purpose that to be. God is so, he is such a God of detail, such a God of purpose. And, and you know, the, the, um, artistic ability, the creativity, the seeing things deeper, the everything having a meaning, a purpose, that is God. That has God's fingerprints written all over it. So we, if nothing else, we can appreciate and love and admire the book of Lamentations for that. Just seeing that, the structure of how it was written. So, okay, on that, first and second chapter are having 22 verses. Now, if you picked up on this, the third chapter does not have 22, it has three times as much, 66 verses. And how this is written, the structure in this middle chapter, middle chapter, so we have chapters one and two, we have four and five, and then we have three 
in the middle here um, has three times as many verses as chapters one, two, four, and five. So being in the middle, the very center, let's pay attention right here, three times as much, and how this is laid out is, so the first, second, third verse of chapter three in the Hebrew language um, that all three of those verses start with Aleph, Aleph, Aleph. Then we have verses four, five, and six being bet, bet, bet. And then we have seven, eight, and nine being gimel, gimel, gimel. So it's, um, we see in one and two, it's Aleph, bet, gimel, dalet, hat, het, and it goes all the way down into the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Well, chapter three then speaks each letter three times before moving on and continues on down. Um, just beautiful. Just, just this is the middle. Th this is one that we need to pay attention to. There's more in this that it's spoken. You know, it's three times as much. And what's beautiful about this, hopefully you picked up as you read, that there's so much hope right here in the middle of this book. There's so much hope spoken. Surrounding this is so much this wailing and this mourning and this crying out loud, this acknowledging being broken by the condition of Jerusalem. And here, right here, tucked in the middle, in chapter three, is this chapter with so much hope. This, this pouring out, this understanding of who God is. That, that God's mercies are new every morning. That his loving kindness is legit. We see this at the very middle. God is all about being in the center. He wants us being in the center of he, who he is. So wrapped up in his heart, being in the center. And we need to allow God to be in the center, the very middle of who we are, consuming everything that we do. Every way that we feel, every thought that we think, the very center. It's the middle. It's got to be in the middle for it to be real. It can't be the surfacey stuff. It's got to be down deep in the middle. And we see this, chapter 3, so much hope being spoken. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Okay, with that, let's go at this. Um, chapter 3 is a lot about Jeremiah sharing in Israel's affliction. So, um, again, this brokenness, we see so much of Jeremiah's heart, so much of his sensitivity, how he is being heartbroken over things going on and, and really empathizing, really putting himself in their shoes and, and understanding this, going deeper, not just saying, oh, I'm so sorry you're going through this, but he feels it. He feels all that is taking place. He is seeing this destruction. It's very, very personal to him. So he starts off. Uh, verse 1, I am the man who has seen affliction because of the rod of his wrath. He has driven me and made me walk in darkness and not in life. Surely against me he has turned his hand repeatedly all the day. He has caused my flesh and my skin to waste away. He has broken my bones. He has besieged and encompassed me with bitterness and hardship. Continuing on down, I mean, this is this is, this is mourning, this is grieving, this is speaking. But again, it's not this chaotically venting, this chaotically just puking up all of these emotions. There's order, there's structure. And how God spoke this into his heart, allowing him to express his emotions in, in this structure and even just knowing and what we talked about and how chapter three was written out. With this, the consistency, the in order, the structure of the Hebrew alphabet, that it means something, that it is something, that there's purpose, that it can be laid out, that something can come out of this, something can, you know, we can follow along, we can understand, we can grasp a hold. It's not this, that, that we're, it's a helpless situation and we're all over the place. There's so much in this, there's so much beauty in this and, and just seeing how it was written, the structure in it. So Jeremiah just continues on and, and um, I mean, this is low. This is heavy stuff. He is he is really expressing in such a grieving, a grieving way. Then let's jump to uh, verse 20. Surely my soul remembers and is bowed down within me. Then verse 21. This I recall to mind. Therefore, I have hope. I have hope. So this I recall to mind. Jeremiah has just finished speaking 20 verses of just pain, of just this grieving, of just this brokenness, this mourning, this anguish, this agony, speaking of this, expressing this verbally, knowing it in his mind, emotionally, just all of this going on, seeing the destruction of Jerusalem. He sees it. 
It's it's done. It's it's perished. It's in ruins. It's been burnt down. These walls are broken down. Just looking out, there's nothing beautiful about it. It's broken. It's it's done for. There's nothing left. In the very middle of this and seeing. And this, I mean, this is like this is like a gut check. Like everything is gone. The people are gone. This city that once stood for something great, that had God's name written all over it, this city, these people that they're done, they're destroyed. And in this, Jeremiah says, I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. I remember who God is. I'm focusing on who God is. I feel this pain, it's real, it's legit. This stuff is actually happening. I'm not imagining this destruction. It's it's here, it's happening, it's present. I'm not imagining that God's people have been taken away into captivity, that this judgment has come and it's come hard and it's come severely. He's not imagining it. This is happening. But he says, I'm remembering. I'm recalling this to mind. Therefore, I have hope. I have hope because I know who God is. I know this God who has spoken through me. I know what he has spoken um, regarding this judgment. Yet also this promised restoration. This what, Who and, and what God has done. Who he is. What he's about. The way his heart has been poured out. Giving opportunities and warning. Knowing the desire of his heart is not this. It's not for them to be destroyed. It's not for Jerusalem to look like this. Jeremiah knows. He recalls. He remembers. He is rehearsing. He is going back to what God has spoken and and how he is connected with the Lord, how he's connected himself, been obedient and faithful um, concerning the word of the Lord. Therefore, I have hope. Verse 22, he continues, in this broken state, in this destruction, in the very middle of this hopelessness and the very middle of this darkness and this gloom and this depression that he's just expressed verbally in the middle of this he confidently speaks therefore i have hope the lord's loving kindnesses indeed never cease for his compassions never fail do we speak that in the middle of our pain in the middle of our grief in the middle of bad days In the middle of frustrating situations, do we stand there and can we speak the loving kindnesses of the Lord that they never cease? That he is a holy God, that he is a loving God, that he is a good God. Are we speaking that confidently? When everything seems to be crumbling down and and just falling apart, do we speak, Lord, you are good and you have never, ever failed me. His compassions never fail. Verse 23, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Do we speak that wholeheartedly, not just to sound good, not just to feel better, but do we speak that believing that? Great, great are you, Lord. Great is your faithfulness. That you are faithful. Though I am looking at a mess, though I am feeling Though I'm feeling destroyed, though looking around me, nothing seems to be working or going well, but you are faithful. You are good. Do we speak that? Do we say that? Do we live like we believe that? Are we living in that powerful truth that he is faithful, that he is good, that he will never, ever, ever fail us? Can we see the purpose in the pain? Do we trust him in the suffering? Are we waiting for him when we don't understand what in the world is going on? Are we living that truth out? Does it mean something? Are we letting that meet us in the very middle of who we are, in the very center, in the depths of our souls? Are we living that out? Verse 24, it continues. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have hope in him, in him, Not in these circumstances, not in certain people, not that my circumstances will get better. That's not hoping that God will make my circumstances better. It's just, I have hope in the Lord. No matter what my circumstances are and look like, no matter if they remain this till the day I die, I have hope in the Lord. I believe that he has a plan and purpose. I believe that he is good. I believe that he's got me. I believe that he's fighting for me. I believe that his desires for me to be connected to him, not to live a mess-free, pain-free life, not to live a comfortable life. That's not his desire. That's not what he's after. He's after the deeper issues for for life to, to mean something, for us to be free in him, to live real, purposeful lives. 
The Lord is my portion. Therefore, I have hope in him. Verse 25, the Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the person who seeks him. It is good that he waits silently for the salvation of the Lord to not get worked up, to not get restless, to not get chaotically like, let's do something, let's fix something, let's deal with this, let's let's run away from this, let's avoid this, let's not confront this. None of that. Wait silently for the salvation of the Lord, that we wait on him and we know that he is after our good, to do good to us, that he gives us a future and a hope that this is for us to prosper, this is for us to succeed, this is for us to be free. When we trust the Lord, we know that we have him all over us, that we have his power upon us, we have his hand on us, surrounding us, carrying us through. That doesn't mean that things are gonna be great and perfect. That means that we can stand strong. We don't have to be shaken. We can let real things happen within us, that real growth can take place, that we can be connected even more intimately to Father. That's what he's after. That's how good, that's how good he is, that no matter what is going on in life, we can stand and we can stand boldly and confidently knowing our hope can be so rooted in a God who holds all power that he is capable of doing anything and everything and he fights for us and he will do whatever it takes to get us into real, meaningful, purposeful, beautiful, abundant life with him. No matter what happens, we can wait. We can wait, we can hope, we can trust, we can be still and settled, waiting silently, confidently, powerfully, so strong and full in him. So good. Okay, Um, let's go to verse 28. Let him sit alone and be silent since he, the Lord, has laid it on him. Sit alone, that we can be set apart, that we don't need to sit in the junk of it. We don't need to sit in the sulk of it. We don't need to sit and dwell in the suffering. We can separate ourselves. This word sit alone is alone. It is separate. That's the Hebrew word, just getting away, apart, alone, desolate, by yourself. Take that with the things that go on, the circumstances that God says that we could be separate, sit alone, sit away from that. That yes, it's happening, it's around, it's present. We can. That's what we see. That's our present circumstance. That's our present situation here. But we don't need to sit in that. We don't need to be engrossed with that. We don't need to dwell there in that suffering, in those crummy circumstances. God says sit alone. Sit alone and be silent. Block out those voices of what they're speaking, of what they're screaming at us. Just hopelessness, death, depression, desolation. That's what what our circumstances speak to us. When Jeremiah was looking at the destruction of Jerusalem, when he saw all the people in captivity, when he saw all these things happening to God's people, that just, ugh, the weight of all of this, that he could so easily hear and see what these circumstances are, but God wants to take us deeper. God says, you sit alone and be still, be silent in me that you don't need to hear what the world is speaking. You don't need to see what the world wants you to see. God says, you can look in deeper. You can see me in this. You can see purpose in this. You can see my heart and my mercy and my loving kindness. You can have hope in that. You can hear my voice speaking to you, drawing you, exposing the stuff that you need to take care of so that you can be free. That's what God wants us after. That's what God wants us to see and hear. Get alone. Break away from what the world wants us to see and hear. Sit alone, it says in verse 28. Let him sit alone and be silent since he has laid it on him. That we can trust God. We can trust him. If these things are happening, we can trust and know that God is fully capable of removing these things from our life. But if they're not being removed, if God's not lifting them off of us, then we can stay right where we're at. We can keep our minds focused on truth. We can keep our emotions under submission of the Lord, being led by him and his truth, not getting all carried away. We can trust God. We can know that he's up to something. 
and we can wait for him to reveal that to us. We can wait for him to lead us in these circumstances, in this pain, in this suffering. And it's not always that he leads us out of those physical, tangible pains and sufferings and and rough circumstances. But we can be still, we can be silent, we can trust that God's gonna lead us somewhere, that he's gonna take us deeper. He's gonna lead us into more of his righteousness, more of his comfort, more of his intimacy, more of his heart and his love for us. That's what we can trust in. That's why we can be still, even in the midst of chaos, even in the midst of everything around us falling apart. God's got it. God's got us. He's surrounding all, he comes in and he overwhelms everything that's overwhelming us. That's, that's what God's after. That's what he's about. He's drawing us and we can trust him. Our hope can be in him. Okay, uh, let's go down to verse Verse 31, for the Lord will not reject forever. 32, for if he causes grief, then he will have compassion according to his abundant loving kindness. It's who he is. It's what he is after to love. If he brings about this grief, then we know it's not his purpose to just bring about grief. If he's bringing grief, then he's bringing compassion. Then right after this grief, right after this suffering, right after this pain, right after these difficulties, then compassion's coming, then strength is coming, then restoration is coming, then healing is coming, then depth is coming. When we know God, when we seek him, we get that. We know that and we can stand on that truth. We see that that's the pattern of the Lord, that it never ends in suffering. It never ends in grief. When we are in relationship with the Lord, it never ends that way. That's never the end. That's never, ever the end. So if grief comes, if, if grief If grief just slaps us in the face, if pain slaps us in the face, then we know that we can cling to the Lord, we can trust him, we can wait on him and what he's got for us, the reward in this when we continue, if we continue to seek the Lord is absolutely shut up, ridiculous, absolutely worth it. Knowing God, seriously, the stillness in knowing God, the way we can sit back and just trust God no matter what comes our way, no matter what we're looking at no matter what we're hearing, no matter what is going on in our lives, we can trust and know that if grief comes, compassion's on its way. Verse 32, spoke it clearly. Okay, let's go to verse 33. This is so good. For he does not afflict willingly or grieve the sons of men. He does not afflict willingly. This so, so stuck out to me. I had to sit, I I had to plant my feet here on this verse a little bit. I read it and something happened in my spirit. For he does not afflict willingly. That word afflict is the word ana. That's the Hebrew word ana. That means to depress, to afflict, just as it says. He does not afflict. He does not depress. Guys, Lamentations, you ask anyone and people would say it's just depressing. It's a depressing book. And I read this and my spirit just rose up within me that the word to depress is in this. This word ana. He does not depress Lamentations is not to bring about this depression upon us, to get us sunken in and sulking down and this is heavy and this is sad and and God did all of this upon his people. It is not to depress. God does not depress willingly. He does not afflict willingly. He does not just do things to to cause us to be just at grief and, and, and just feeling destroyed and feeling discouraged. God does not act that way. He does not respond in that way. He does not speak in that way. He does not cause things to happen to depress us, to afflict us. So if things happen in our life and we feel depressed, then we have got to, re- we've got to think, we've got to refocus. We've got to grab onto a new perspective. We've got to seek after the Lord and say, God, you are not in the business of depressing. You are not in the business of afflicting. You are not in the business of destroying. That is not what God is after. And seeking him, we know that and we can stand on that truth. And therefore realizing that, then we can go after the Lord and choose to see deeper. Okay, God, I'm feeling depressed in this. So this is not of you. What do you want to show me in this? What do you want to speak to me in this? I'm listening to, I'm hearing too much of the world in this situation. I'm seeing too much of the world in these circumstances. What do you want to show me? God is not, he does not afflict or depress willingly. So willingly, I'm reading this firsthand right off the bat and I'm like, okay, he does not depress willingly. 
that means it is not his desire, it's not his goal to come in and to just depress us. These judgments, these things that can bring about depression and destruction, these things are because of our choosing to sin, our choosing to turn away from the Lord. So that made sense to me, this willingly, like thinking, okay, God doesn't do this. This isn't part of his plan. But when we turn from the Lord, then he being a righteous God, you know, it brings about then this affliction. It brings about then this captivity that we have chosen. So I'm like, yes, that makes sense. That's powerful. But then I look up the Hebrew word of willingly and it doesn't quite hit like, oh, just on his own. Like he doesn't do it on his own. It's not his original plan. It, it hits something completely different. And, and both... Both, you know, understanding of this are so beautiful. That makes sense. It made sense to me, the willingness that, that that's true. It's not God who purposes these things, but he cannot bless wickedness. So when we turn from him, you know, consequences are there. They're legit. They, these punishments have to take place um, because of our disobedience. So um, when I looked up that word willingly, this is the word lev um, in Hebrew. And this means the heart the very center. So verse 33, for he does not afflict willingly. He does not afflict. He does not depress. This isn't his heart, of his heart, the center of his heart. This is not the desire that comes out. This is not what he does. The center of his heart, what he is after is so much more what comes after these judgments, what comes after the discipline, the response, the turning back to the Lord is what God is after. He is all about the heart. He is all about things going deeper, the very center, the very depths of what is going on. It's got to be in this. We have got to meet God in the center of his heart. We've got to allow him to be in the center of us. Again, chapter three, this is that emphasis. This is that bringing in the very center, being in the middle, not the surfacey stuff. We've got to go deeper. We've got to get real. It's got to be authentic. It's got to be this, this surrender where we bring ourselves to the middle so that everything can blow up from that. Everything can grow from that. That can be our foundation, being in the very center of who God is, standing on his truth so that we can be consumed and surrounded by what matters. It's getting down to the heart of things. So good. God is in this to bring us to life. He brings justice to draw us into freedom. We see in verse 34, to crush under his feet all the prisoners of the land, to deprive a man of justice in the presence of the Most High. This goes on, um, goes in continuation of 33, for he does not afflict willingly. He does not crush under his feet all the prisoners of the land to deprive a man of justice. That's not what he's after. It's not about depriving them from this discipline and this justice, this righteousness that is brought about, this judgment. It's not depriving them. It's not destroying them. It's to awaken them. It's to bring them into position where it can be real, where it can be in the middle. It can be in the very center, the very depth of who we are meeting in the depths and seeing and discovering the depths of who he is. That's what God is after. Let's jump down to verse 38. Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that both good and ill um, go forth? The Lord only has plans of goodness for us. It's all goodness. Things happen. Things, things come about. Judgments take place. Discipline has to, to take place. But we've got to know that the Lord is good. He is about goodness and goodness for us and in our life so that we can live fully, freely, in and with him. Verse 39, why should any living mortal or any man offer complaint in view of his sins? Let us examine and probe our ways and let us return to the Lord. Again, these judgments, this discipline is about our returning to him. It's about taking responsibility. It's about humbling ourselves. It's about seeing our sin and dealing with them, responding to it by turning from those ways and returning to the Lord, allowing God to work in us. Verse 41, we lift up our heart and hands toward God in heaven. We have transgressed and rebelled. You have not pardoned. Again, turning in repentance. This is about our sins. Their rebellion. This Jerusalem sinned. They sinned. They forsook the Lord. They worshiped other idols. They did not follow his commands. They did not, they didn't do anything that God told them to do. They turned away. They turned away and because of that, because of that rebellion, because of that defiance, because of that disobedience, then judgment came. 
and this cry of, of humility and repentance, we lift up our heart and hands toward God in heaven. We acknowledge our sin and we turn to the Lord, seeking after the Lord. That's, that's why judgment is done, for us to be brought back to the Lord. Um, continuing on and just, this is what's going on. This is where we're at. Verse 47, panic and pitfall have befallen us. Devastation and destruction. Then we see in um, verse 48 <clears throat> on down, I believe through close to the end of the chapter, Jeremiah is just pouring out his heart. My eyes run down with streams of water. Because of the destruction of the daughter of my people, my eyes pour down unceasingly without stopping until the Lord looks down and sees from heaven. My eyes bring pain to my soul. Uh, we see in verse 52, my enemies without cause hunted me down like a bird. They have silenced me in the pit. Waters flowed over my head. <clears throat> This is Jeremiah weeping and mourning and feeling again the brokenness. We see his sensitivity. Like he's a crybaby in the best way possible because he chooses to see. He chooses not to deny, not to turn away. Oh, as long as I'm following the Lord, I'm good. No, he sees and he cares and he's concerned and he chooses to follow the Lord and being obedient and giving this word. Guys, the Lord, it's so crazy how the Lord chose Jeremiah this very sensitive, this very tender-hearted man to speak such a harsh message. I mean, Jeremiah was told to approach the people and to speak, hey, you're all gonna die. You're all gonna be destroyed. You're, this, this land's gonna be destroyed. Like, it's gonna be in ruins. It's gonna be burnt down. This wall that serves as all your security and your, your, your prosperity, your success, your identity, your, all of this, it's gonna, be, it's gonna crumble down to the floor. It's gonna be pulled down. All of this is gonna be gone. Jeremiah speaks this and says, if you don't wake up and pay attention, God's going to do something. God is coming against you. God is going to cause this to happen and that to happen and this to your kids and this to your, this to your parents and this to your land and this to, I mean, this was crazy stuff. And God chose this sensitive, tender-hearted man to speak this message of judgment. So, so crazy. He prophesied judgment and destruction upon the people of Jerusalem and he saw it happen. God, God said, okay, you're tender, you're sensitive, you're going to speak this. People aren't going to like it. You're not going to like it. You're not going to like speaking it. It's not going to, it's going to go out of, it's going to be so out of your comfort zone. It's not going to feel comfortable. It's not going to be something you want to do. Guys, sometimes when God calls us to do things, it's not fun. It, it doesn't feel safe. And, and that's where Jeremiah was. He, he was weeping. He saw, he felt things very, very, very personally so much empathy, so much just so much sensitivity. And God called him out to just jump into this very uncomfortable thing to speak this message. And that's what makes it real. How God uses these people. It's not always what we assume, who he'll use and how he'll use them and where he'll call us to be. He speaks and he's got a plan and he's got a purpose and he sees and knows how and, and what the best way of reaching his people will be. Jeremiah coming in and speaking this, you're gonna be destroyed and God's gonna come against you and you need to change your ways. That wouldn't have come across so well with someone with a very strong personality. But Jeremiah coming and, and in tears and broken over this, that it was a way where the people would see this is for real. He's not coming to condemn us. He is coming because he cared. Now the world and the people, they saw it as, oh, Jeremiah, you're just coming to destroy us. You're doing this and that, but you can't fake real. And, and you can't tell me that people couldn't see how authentic Jeremiah was, the sensitivity of his heart. You can't tell me that people didn't see that. They may not have wanted to see it. They may have spoke against it. They may have blinded themselves to it because they didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to see it. But what purpose, what the, just the heart of God and using Jeremiah in that and what sorrow came upon Jeremiah as he declared what truly came to be. That now he sees what was spoken. How emotional of a ride um, that must have been for Jeremiah. Okay, um, continuing on, verse 56, you have heard my voice. So now we see more of the hope that's thrown in more of this chapter. That he cries out, he says, this is what's taking place, this is what's going on. But he says, you've heard my voice. Verse 57, you drew near when I called on you. You said, do not fear. Verse 58, oh Lord, you have pleaded my soul's cause. You have redeemed my life. Oh Lord, you have seen my oppression. Judge my case. 
continuing on, Jeremiah just says, you see me, you know, um, you'll deal. You're a righteous God. You are righteous, faithful God. So we see that just all the way till the end of verse 66. Um, so much, so much power in that chapter. We see again just this mourning and this wailing. But um, again, recapping that 66 verses, three times as many, still going through the alphabet in such poetic form and such... Um, you know, orderly, structured form in this crying out, in this feeling the reality of pain, yet so much hope put in of Jeremiah crying out saying, you are a righteous God. You are a faithful God. You've never failed us. You've never turned away from us. This is you and you're doing and you're all powerful and you're faithful. We praise you. You are worthy of all of our praise. It is good to sit silently and wait for you for your salvation. Um, and then speaking just this testimonies, God, you drew close to me. You heard my voice. You've redeemed my life. Um, so much hope. So much of this, no matter what's going on, we can stand steadfast in the hope of the Lord, in the joy of the Lord, in his promises, knowing what he's about, what he's after, restoration, healing, all of that goodness. Um, it's so absolutely beautiful. So good. So again, Lamentations, it's so much more than just this depression. There's so much more. Let's keep going after more. Let's keep going after the heart of God where all the more-ness there is, <laughs> it's there. Life is there. Abundance is there. Purpose is there. Okay. Uh, that finishes it up with this chapter. Our next video, we are going to finish up the book of Lamentations. So don't miss it. Uh, let's keep going after it. Let's keep just reading. Let's keep, let's keep going deeper. I can't wait for what God has for us. I can't wait for how Lamentations, um, what God's going to do, how he's going to sink it in, how he's going to use it in, in just our everyday practical, you know, way of living. He's going to do it. If we're seeking after him, when he says, if you seek after me with your whole heart, you'll find me. That part of finding him is being connected with him, is, is allowing those solid truths to remain with us. So that we find him in so much because of his truth, because of how we go after him purposefully, how we're reading, not to just read, but to read, to know, to understand, to be changed by him, by his spirit. So good. Uh, thanks so much for walking this out with me. Uh, loving this, loving this journey, loving this entire journey. It's amazing. So that's it. I'll see you soon in my next video as we will finish up Lamentations then. So thanks so much. See you soon.